Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for a briefing to discuss the 2021 Sustainable Energy in America Factbook. I'm Dan Bursett, Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. ESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change policies. We have also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. Our event today is sponsored by our friends at the Business Council for Sustainable Energy and hosted in coordination with the leadership and members of the Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. Many thanks to Senators Reed, Crapo, Van Hollen, and Collins for your support and assistance today with our briefing. Before I introduce my co-moderator and turn things over to her, let me very briefly share some logistics. First, as with all ESI briefings, we will post an archive of the webcast along with presentation materials to our website. If you miss anything or want to revisit any of the topics you're about to cover, please visit us online at www.eesi.org. And while you're there, please take a moment to sign up for our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions, which is the best way to keep up with the full range of our policymaker education and technical assistance resources. And second, after our final panelist, uh, we will transition to a discussion. And that means we will have time for questions from our online audience. If you have a question, please follow EESI on Twitter at EESI Online and send in your questions that way. You can also send us an email and the address to use is the EESI at EESI.org. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Lisa Jacobson. Lisa is the president of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, a 55 member trade association representing the energy efficiency, renewable energy and natural gas industries. Lisa advises states and federal policymakers on energy, tax, air quality and climate change policy. She is a member of DOE's State Energy Efficiency Steering Committee and, and the United States Trade Representatives Trade and Environment Policy Advisory Committee and Energy Efficiency Global Alliance Steering Committee and the Gas Technology Institute's Public Interest Advisory Committee. It is always a treat to welcome Lisa to one of our briefings. And so now I get to turn it over to you. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dan. It is wonderful to be with you. And I want to start off by thanking the entire EESI team. I think we're going into our fifth year of collaborating together on the release of the Sustainable Energy in America Factbook. The 2021 issue of the Sustainable Energy um, in America Factbook is looking both at long term trends, but a deeper dive on the impacts of COVID 19 on clean energy technology markets and policy. So it's really a fascinating set of work because 2020 was clearly a year like no other. While we faced tremendous challenges in our economy and we suffered tremendous public health losses and the loss of over 350,000 Americans, we also saw a remarkable set of trends as they relate to the US energy sector. And we saw energy efficiency, natural gas and renewable energy continue to accelerate what we've seen as long-term trends. And I'm really pleased to be able to share this data with you today. So I'd like to first, before we introduce our first speaker, share a little background on the project. And if you could please advance to the next slide. The Sustainable Energy in America Factbook project was started nine years ago, and we could see clearly that the energy sector in the United States was changing but we weren't sure really what the baseline was. And we didn't have resources that tried to put it together in a easy to understand and, and up-to-date fashion. Because as we know, the, because of the changes and the rapid advancement of so many of the trends, that if you're looking at data that's a year old, you're often looking at very out-of-date data and a picture that isn't an accurate one. So we wanted to provide a resource that could do it. And each year, the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, working with its members and some outside supporters, works in collaboration with Bloomberg New Energy Finance to put together the fact book. So I wanna thank all the supporters of the project each year. You could go to the next slide, please. All the information that you're gonna hear about today, plus videos, uh, graphics, and other tools to get you into the content quickly can be found on the Business Council for Sustainable Energy's website. It's all available for free, and we welcome your feedback on what we provide. So don't hesitate to drop us a line and let us know. Next slide, please. I also wanted to mention a very exciting complimentary campaign 
that our sister organization, Clean Energy Business Network, performs each year. It's called Faces Behind the Facts. And as we release the data, we want to also showcase clean energy entrepreneurs all over the country that are really on the front lines of the trends that we'll discuss today. So please go to either the BCSC website or the Clean Energy Business Network website and check it out. So with that, I just want to again encourage everybody to go to the website and look at the materials firsthand. And now it's my pleasure to kick off our opening speaking presentation. I would love to introduce Melina Bartels. She's Power Associate for Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and she's also, for the second year in a row, really the lead author and compiler of the data for the Sustainable Energy in America Factbook. So pleased she could join us today. And Melina, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Lisa. Yep, so as Lisa said, my name is Melina Bartels. I've been at Bloomberg for about two years. Um, during that time, I've been compiling the fact book as well. Do you want to go to the next slide? So uh, I'm, I'm going to just give a brief overview of what are considered some of the main slides in the fact book and some of the primary takeaways. Um, so start just to start off, energy productivity, which is the ratio of GDP to total energy consumption, rose in 2020, which is seen here on the left. So we normally use this metric to show how economic growth and energy consumption are increasingly decoupled, as you can see on the right. This means that as the economy expands, our energy consumption doesn't necessarily, i.e. we're using energy increasingly efficiently. But historically, productivity hasn't always risen. So for example, during the 2008-2009 recession, you can see it actually dropped. In those years, the economic collapse rampantly outpaced our cut in energy usage. And while the D GDP shrunk again in 2020, last year was exceedingly unique. In terms of energy, we were forced to curtail our consumption due to a combination of stay-at-home orders, economic hardships, and a wide variety of other factors. So unlike the last recession, in 2020, the declines in our collective energy profiles were extreme, so much so that they matched the pace of the falling GDP. So again, when you divide the falling GDP by our falling energy usage, our productivity actually continued to rise. And then on the next slide. Declines in consumption in, in energy were across the board last year. So coal, petroleum, nuclear, and natural gas all took a hit. The only exception to this role was actually renewables, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, more on the next couple of slides. However, the extremity of declines greatly varied. So each reflected a different shift in our in the day to day of our collective lifestyles. And unsurprisingly, transportation, which is reflected by petroleum consumption, took the largest hit. So energy usage related to Transpo itself dropped a staggering 14% in 2020. So total motor fuel demand was cut almost in half over the course of March alone. And that figure was still recovering throughout the end of the year. On the right on this slide, uh, the solid black line shows how electricity demand has bounced up and down year over year for a while now. Uh, as I've mentioned, different sectors saw different levels of demand drops, and electricity was actually hit the least on a percentage basis. So electricity demand actually only fell 4%. Again, this is compared to transportation's 14% in 2020. So similar to transportation, power demand deviated from its norm most intensely in the spring. But unlike transportation demand, it actually rebounded in a couple of months. So where electricity demand dropped heavily in the commercial and industrial sectors, it was ultimately buoyed by unprecedented work from home conditions and steep rises in residential demand, particularly over the summer as people needed to cool their homes. And on the next slide. Uh, but the power sector was ultimately down in 2020. So it needed to be even pickier with the types of generators being fired. Renewables, with their zero short run marginal costs, had a great year. They captured about 20% of the market and increased their generation on absolute terawatt hour terms by an impressive 11%. Gas trends market share rose slightly, not as impressive. It rose about 3%. This is compared to last year's increase of 7%, so a bit of a decline there. Um, gas's rise was largely tied in part to supply side dynamics triggered by the oil crisis last spring. Um, and as a result, gas prices did have a truly exceptional year uh, in how low they were. 
On the other hand, coal prices did not, so gas continued to displa displace coal in the power system. And between this gas displacement and ongoing coal plant disclosures, coal, in fact, had less than 20% of a market share in 2020, and on absolute terawatt hour uh, terms, it fell a staggering 22%. Next slide. But arguably the most significant trend in 2020 was the astounding 33.8 gigawatts of renewable capacity that were built. So last year's clean energy installations were 50% higher than those in 2016, which was the previous record holder. So both wind and solar broke records last year. Wind build hit 17.1 gigawatts installed. Onshore utility projects proceeded with construction largely unchecked. Developers also were rushing to start construction uh, earlier in the year, um, particularly to capture that highest level of the federal PTC, which we all know has now been extended. Solar additions also broke a record at 16.5 gigawatts, so both utility scale and residential were extremely resilient in 2020. Uh, most utility scale build was done in the south, and residential solar recovered from any early on disruptions in the year, uh, which were caused by lockdowns, so homeowner demand actually held pretty strong throughout all of 2020. Next slide. And you know, while renewable energy build booms, gas power plant build holds pretty relatively steady. Um, despite mandated and announced ambitions on both the state and federal levels to decarbonize the power sector, there are still 38 gigawatts of gas-fired power plants, uh, which are broken out here by CCGTs and OCGTs and colored by region, uh, that are filed to come online in the next five years. So just to put this in context, this is so this build over the next five years is only slightly higher than the 40, 34 gigawatts of renewables that came online last year alone. Um, but there is the ever important distinction that capacity build does not actually match or reflect generation uh, when you compare across power technologies. So a gigawatt of gas installed tends to mean more terawatt hours of gas being generated. Um, and also just another thing to note, so considering historical trends, not all of these plants will actually be built, probably only 30 to 40% of them will. Uh, it's, it's likely um, that many will ultimately be canceled or remove their filings before they turn on. That said, PJM, which here uh, is represented by the green bars and spans the mid-Atlantic and Midwest, remains the most popular region for gas builds. So about 46% of all of the current filings are in PJM, uh, this is largely because Appalachian Shale continues to provide ample and stable prices for power plants that are aiming to build among an aging coal fleets in states with very weak RPS targets. Next slide. But there, but there are a few ways that gas can fit into decarbonization, and one way is um, for it to blend natural gas fuels with hydrogen. So while the U.S. is really far behind on hydrogen policy and implementing hydrogen and other components of the energy economy, we do in fact have the largest pipeline of hydrogen burning power plants in the world. So as you can see on the left, there are 6.4 gigawatts, which is also to put into context about 20% of the total pipeline on the previous slide of gas plants will actually burn at least some combination of hydrogen. And so on the right, you can see which companies own these projects where they're located along the left axis, and when they'll actually come online along the bottom axis. And the projects with blue bars are in states with uh, state level clean energy targets, purple bars are in states that aren't. So it's a, it, one thing that's important to note here is that company, when companies announce a hydrogen burning power plant, that by no means translates to that project having even close to the majority of its fuel coming from hydrogen. So yellow dots and the percents on the bars here or the share of hydrogen these plants will, in reality, intend to burn. So for example, the long range CCGT in Ohio will burn about 20% hydrogen and 80% gas when it turns on in 2021. Another interesting fact about hydrogen, so the largest hydrogen deal announced in 2020 was actually by Mitsubishi. So through a $3 billion deal, they intend to build three of the projects on the right-hand graph. Um, that's the dense, Gammer, Energy LLC, Balico, and Emberclear. And then next slide. So finally, 
U.S. greenhouse gas emissions plummeted in 2020. So they sank 9% from the year prior. And this was led by deeply, deeply depressed transportation and power emissions. So the declines in transpo were the steepest. Uh, they more or less directly reflected the 14% decline in consumption. So emissions actually themselves dropped 14%. Um, but even with this change, the sector still remained uh, the largest source of emissions for the fifth consecutive year in a row. Just once again, reaffirming and proving how crucial this sector is to focus on decarbonization. Um, power emissions played out a little differently as they usually do, but especially this year. So power emissions actually fell faster than power consumption did by a record 11%, and that's compared to the 4% decline in power demand. So power emissions ultimately hovered slightly above the levels of industry, um, which it's worth noting industry in cover, er, incorporates upstream oil and gas activity. And then on the right, we mapped power emissions if you flip to the next slide, actually. We mapped power emissions uh, with the pathways to the CPP and Biden's target. So the CPP was designed um, to essentially cut 32% of 2005 emissions by 2030. Even before the pandemic, the power sector was easily on track to beat this target, and 2020 put the nation even further ahead of it. Um, last year, power emissions were actually down 40% from 2005 levels. And then we have Biden's target, which is the proffered net zero by 2035. So for power, this rate of decline linearly actually wouldn't necessarily outpace historical rates of decline. However, um, as we all know, future emissions will likely be harder to mitigate than those in the past. So I it, essentially saying that this will not be a linear, would not play out as a linear decline. Um, and yeah, that's all I had for my introduction and passing it back. To your participation later in the Q&A. So now it's my pleasure to introduce a set of panelists, uh, business council members that both uh, were part of the development process for the fact book, but also have some unique perspectives when it comes to different points of, of data that Melina discussed, as well as areas in the fact book that we haven't covered yet. But I think before I introduce them, you know, when I hear the story of 2020, again, I think it's quite remarkable that clean energy, energy efficiency, natural gas, renewable energy, that portfolio uh, performed so well. And we really are the growth sectors of the U.S. energy economy. So there's many new innovations uh, that are coming our way, and a partnership is definitely needed through, with policymakers and the private sector. But it gives me confidence uh, when I see at a, at a very uh, unprecedented set of circumstances, the continued acceleration of the clean energy transformation. And one of the things that we didn't touch on yet is why, and I, I know we'll discuss it uh, with the panelists and in the Q&A, but when I look at the data, I really, focus on two areas. I focus on the cost effectiveness of clean energy technologies and the fact that customers want clean energy. And so we're fortunate in the United States that we have such a diverse and rich set of, of technologies, processes, and resources to draw upon. So with that, let me tell you who our panelists are, and then we will go in turn to each one of them. But I'm going to introduce them all right now. Our first panelist will be Charles Hernick, Vice President of Policy and Advocacy for Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions. Then we'll hear from Ben Evans, Vice President of Public Affairs for the Alliance to Save Energy. Next, we'll hear from ben Bryn Baker, Director of Policy Innovation at the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance. And then Allison Hull, Director of Federal Government Affairs for Sempra Energy. So, Charles, I'd love to turn it to you first, and I've asked each of the panelists to share just some key points to get us started with a conversation and also share one of their favorite backbook slides. So, Charles, love to turn it to you now, please. Sure. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all today um, and, and looking at the new data in the fact book each year. Uh, it's like a holiday for me because I think the story is impressive uh, and, and what Melina was describing in terms of the growth trajectory um, 
in the renewable sector in particular, but, but sustainable energy writ large uh, is really um, fascinating and important. And I think that one of the things that I wanna draw attention to on, on the next slide here um, is how federal policy uh, has been supportive of that, um, that storytelling um, and what's up next. And very specifically, at the close of 2020, the Energy Act of 2020 was passed in a bipartisan fashion and represented a substantial update to US energy policy and benefited a lot of the technologies that are really gonna be needed to be able to drive emissions uh, down to these, these net zero goals that we're all aiming for. Um, $34 billion uh, in uh, potential um, cash put on the table by the US federal government in terms of direct um, authorizations for R&D spending and then also the availability uh, for tax credits. It's not the last step that we're gonna need in this, uh, in this effort to tackle climate change, but I think the consensus is that it's a, a, a solid first step uh, and an important down payment on uh, keeping us on that trajectory uh, that we need to be to accomplish our, our climate change goals. So what the slide you're looking at right now shows is how uh, U.S. Uh, spending in, in clean energy stacked up uh, to other, other uh, countries in the world, but also breaking it up into uh, those portions that are uh, tax-related and uh, direct spend uh, authorizations. What's also important in the backdrop here is that the, the U.S. federal spending is just one part of it. I think that the other thing that impressed me about 2020 were all of the voluntary commitments made by financiers. Uh, that are greening their investment portfolios, and it's easier than ever uh, for individuals to be able to green their 401k um, and, and focus on, on clean energy there. Uh, so it's, it's really important. And if we go to the next slide, there's a great breakdown here in the fact book of where this money is going. And it touches on uh, important areas, carbon capture, uh, utilization and storage demonstration projects, looking at the next generation of, of solar, important finance for energy storage, tax credit, uh, modest extensions for, for some of the projects that were likely or, or, or um, we know were delayed uh, on account of, of COVID. Um, and then also a, a multi-year extension for offshore wind, which is really gonna be necessary for getting that industry up on its legs. So what we have here is a, a little bit extra runway and a very strong uh, price signal coming from the federal government. That this is a great area uh, for investment. And so my hope is that we'll see continued growth in this sector for years to come. Uh, next, I'd like to turn to Ben Evans with the Alliance to Save Energy. Great, thanks uh, ESI and, and Dan uh, and BCSE and Lisa so much. Uh, Lisa, I, I was thinking about it, I think it was about a year ago, right around now where I think it was my last day in sort of the before times world. I was at a BCSE board meeting in, uh, in Washington and Senator Murkowski spoke. Um, it was, it, I think that was my last day in, in the office. So great to uh, be back here and on, on a, such a strange anniversary. Um, but, um, and it just wanted to, if we could go to the next slide, um, I think, uh, what what the fact book really points to um, for energy efficiency is is just what a strange year it was and what what a, what a fluke it was. We we as Melina said, you know, we used a lot less energy. In some ways, it's surprising that we didn't use um, e even less uh, than we did um, and make a, a lot more efficiency gains. Um, but it, but the gains that we did have were, were really for all the wrong reasons, and we need to get things back on track. I think one thing it does point to. However, as Melina uh, mentioned, is the power of energy efficiency to, to, to reduce carbon emissions and to meet some of our, our decarbonization goals. I think we often get um, swept up in the new technologies on the generation side, and rightfully so, all the exciting things going on over there. We sometimes forget the other side of the ledger, that the demand side, by, by using energy as efficiently as we can, is, is the cheapest and fastest way to, to decarbonize and to, to, to meet some of these carbon goals. And so um, there's, I think there's a, there's a lesson for it in there. The other, the other thing that jumps out from 2020 with, with energy efficiency is the job side. I think um, 
you know, people forget that energy efficiency is the largest employer in the clean energy economy. We started 2020 with about 2.4 million jobs, um, and we ended with with about 300,000 less. Um, and that's that is a huge, obviously a huge impact. And and most of those job losses. Uh, most energy efficiency jobs are in construction, working in buildings, homes and buildings and making efficiency improvements, manufacturing things like insulation or high efficiency windows and, and building components. And I think we those job losses were really tough. I mean, you know, for a variety of reasons, economic downturn, people not wanting folks working in their homes, the utility program shutting down. Um, we saw really, really severe losses in that sector. And, and that's where the Alliance is really focused most of its attention in terms of rebuilding. And we have a number of proposals that we are uh, you know, working on on the Hill um, around expanding and improving tax incentives, for example, for homeowners to make efficiency improvements, um, uh, building owners to make efficiency improvements. Um, we have a, a grant program for small businesses to be able to um, get, you know, use, utilize existing utility programs and get some federal matching dollars to make you know, low cost or no cost efficiency improvements to their buildings. Um, and we have a proposal to use performance contracting to retrofit millions or hundreds of thousands of, of buildings around the country, um, critical buildings, public buildings, hospitals, schools, uh, libraries, uh, airports, and things like that. Um, so look forward to talking about those those ideas more, but that's generally where we where we stand on the efficiency side. Thanks so much, Ben. That was really helpful. Next, I'd like to welcome Bryn Baker with Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance. She is new uh, to the, the FACBOOK partnership, and we really appreciate her and Reba, Reba's involvement this year. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Lisa. And, and thank you to EESI today as well. Um, we can go ahead and go to the, the next slide. Um, but uh, I'm here representing the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance, uh, which is a, a community of electricity customers collectively working toward a zero carbon energy system and, and seeking to, to green the grid for, for all customers. Our, our members represent over six trillion in annual revenues um, with about 14 million employees across the US uh, and about 70 Fortune 500 companies. And so our, our community is really the, the driving force behind corporate buyers demanding um, and really deploying significant renewable energy into the market, as well as accelerating vehicle electrification and efficiency. And, and this is in large part due to ambitious commitments um, that are deepening and widening in the fact book sort of profile some of the, the recent developments there. So I'll highlight a couple. Um, I think chief among the, the driving factors is the fact that now 285 global companies have committed to 100% renewable energy consumption, at least matching through contracts. 123 companies now have joined a, an initiative called EP100, which is about pledging to improve energy productivity. And it's, it's up to 92 companies now um, committed to vehicle electrification. But on top of that, you've got half of the Fortune 500 that have set climate and clean energy goals and now over 1,200 global companies committing to take science-based action, which is really driving a, an intense interest in clean energy procurement at the same time. So it's really the, the ambition and the breadth of these goals that is uh, continuing to accelerate and really driving impact in the market as, as companies set about meeting them. Um, so I want to share a second slide from the fact book that shows how all of this has been borne out. Um, in, in 2020, the fact book shows that corporate buyers publicly transacted for 11.9 gigawatts of, of offsite wind and solar last year. And this was down um, largely due to COVID from the previous year of 14.1 of gigawatts. Noting that that these figures come from contracts that inc that also include government and university off takers, so I want to mention a subtrend because Reba independently tracks publicly announced offsite deals by corporates, um, which by our data equaled about 10.6 gigawatts of contract capacity. So this is a slightly smaller subset of the data, but that was actually a 13% increase over the previous year of 9.4 gigawatts, and and I mention that because. 
it's equal to about a quarter of new electric capacity added to the grid in 2020. And so at least for this subset of corporate buyers, the largest class of voluntary buyers, it's showing that they're remaining not just committed to clean energy in the face of everything that's happened in the last year, but, but actually accelerating. <laughs> And so I think that's a really key driving trend to be watching in this space is that the buyers are not letting up in their interest in renewable and, and more broadly in clean energy. And so, you know, adding that all up, we find that the cumulative capacity deployed by these types of buyers is now up to 48 gigawatts um, with an increasing share coming from solar over wind. And we also see a strong diversity of buyers in the top 10 list. Uh, obviously, Amazon here is the distinct leader, but you, you also see telecom, auto, tech, retail, steel, higher ed, all represented. Um, so when you, and when you look at the full list of procurers, every sector is represented. So this, the interest in this has really broadened and deepened as well. Um, and I know we're, we're short on time today. I wanted to highlight just a couple of other trends that we're seeing. Um, in just accelerating renewable energy procurement overall. One is that is certainly that corporates are starting to focus on next gen carbon technologies, not just wind and solar. It's really about this broader suite of zero carbon solutions. Uh, several of the deals last year were notable because they coupled solar with storage. Or we also see companies now starting to focus on matching their procurement to time of use and location. Um, and specifically citing projects where the potential for emissions reductions is highest. They're really watching that. And, and so this actually leads to a, an interesting conclusion about market structures enabling this, because what we find is that over 80% of all the 2020 deals, and actually historically all of these deals, have happened in organized wholesale markets. Uh, meaning regions with a regional transmission organization that's independently operating a, a competitive wholesale electricity market. Um, Noting very importantly that a competitive wholesale market is not the same thing as, as choosing a retail electricity supplier. But what we're seeing is that the bulk of this procurement is enabled by market structures that allow for customers to, to choose renewable power. And, uh, and, and those wholesale market structures are available in about two thirds of the country. So just coloring in some of the trends you know, underneath what you see on this chart. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Lisa. Next, I'd love to turn it to Allison Hall with Semper Energy. Welcome, Allison. Thanks so much, Lisa. Uh, of course, my kids have just busted in the door, and it was nice and quiet a moment ago. Um, anyway, <laughs> yes, Allison Hall with Semper Energy. Uh, Semper Energy is the just to give you a little bit of background about the company. Um, we are the owner of one of the most expansive energy networks in North America, serving serving some of the largest markets in the world, including California, Texas, and Mexico. Sempra's family of companies include San Diego Gas and Electric, Southern California Gas Company, Sempra LNG, Encore in Texas, and IENOVA in Mexico. Nearly 75% of our rate base is dedicated to electrification. We're invested in high voltage transmission to remove renewables that everybody's been talking about and the proliferation of renewables from where they're created to demand centers. We also operate the largest energy infrastructure in the country to transport lower and in the future zero carbon molecules to decarbonize power generation, industrial sectors, and heavy duty transportation sectors. We're displacing fuel oil in Mexico with natural gas, where we also have significant renewables generation portfolio. And we even have a strategy to help foreign markets follow the success of the US with our investments in LNG export infrastructure. With our California roots, Semper has been strategically enabling lower carbon energy choices since long before the phrase energy transition began dominating headlines. I don't know if we're showing, yeah, uh, if you could advance the slide, sorry. Perfect. Um, as a fact book notes in the slide here, Global energy transition investment hit 500 billion for the first time last year, a 9% increase over 2019, showing that sustainability is a high priority for America's energy sector. The US provides a case study towards decarbonization, diversification, and digitalization, the three Ds that we at Semper believe drive the energy transition. In many ways, the US is already demonstrating leadership in all three areas as we moved away from coal to cleaner burning natural gas, expanded renewables and invested in transmission and distribution infrastructure and made consistent investments in energy efficiency as previous speakers have all touched on. The slide here also shows that investment in emerging, 
Emerging technologies such as green hydrogen is also growing. The U.S. now invests 100 million per year in hydrogen, the vast majority of which is tied to fuel cell vehicle sales. As green hydrogen projects come online over the next few years, the future potential of gas infrastructure will be unlocked with zero carbon molecules and electrons together delivering resilient, sustainable energy systems. The idea is to leverage surplus renewable electricity generated in the middle of the day when it's not being used to produce green hydrogen, which then can be injected into the natural gas grid for storage and use. Hydrogen blending is an important milestone for providing the clean fuel needed to achieve California's climate goals and the nation's. Semper is particularly keen on driving this promising technology for our networks, our customers, and our environment. SoCal Gas and SDG&E are planning multiple hydrogen blending projects throughout their resp respective service territories. I wanted to quickly highlight one that I recently, uh, I shouldn't say discovered, but that I recently came across that I thought was extremely cool, which is that SoCal Gas is building a state-of-the-art demonstration project to show the role of hydrogen could play in attaining carbon neutrality. It's called the H2 Hydrogen Home, and it is the first of its kind in the U.S. and will include a home, solar panels, a home battery, an electrolyzer to convert solar energy into clean hydrogen, and a fuel cell to convert that hydrogen back to electricity. The hydrogen will also be blended with natural gas for use in the home's appliances. The H2 hydrogen home is expected to be complete by late 2021. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Lisa. Thanks, Allison. Okay, so we've got a content uh, contribution for the next issue of the fact book, uh, assuming that that project continues to go forward. Yeah, that's, that's really exciting. Thanks for sharing that. And I, I wanna thank all the panelists for sharing your thoughts to get us started. and and helping us understand the breadth of information that is in the fact book. So again, feel free to go to the website and check it out yourself uh, to our viewers. So, you know, I'm gonna kind of take us back to where Charles started us off. I think we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the tremendous policy action in Congress at the end of 2020. You know, the Energy Act of 2020, the omnibus appropriations, the tax extensions, I mean, we, in some cases had been working for nearly a decade to see some of those activities enacted into law. Um, of course, there were things that didn't get enacted and we still have a lot of work to do and we have a very busy Congress this session, as we all know. So I wanted to invite all the panelists that wanted to comment. First, you know, what was the most significant set of policy actions that were enacted in 2020 from your company or industry's perspective? And then also, you know, at, at the highest level, because we're going to delve a little deeper on some topic areas, but what are you looking for for action in 2021? So, you know, maybe I will, let's see who I'm going to start with first. I'll start maybe with Ben Evans, and then we can just, others can just, you know, raise their hand if they want to chime in. But Ben, I'll, I'll turn it to you, please. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, and, you know, I think there were there were several things in that year in package for energy efficiency that were great. Nothing nothing that really just, you know, blew the doors off of, off of everything. But you, we had in a permanent extension of a commercial buildings tax incentive. Um, they could have gotten some of the details of it a little better, but but they, they made that permanent, which we think will put some certainty into the market and, and, and improve uptake of that tax incentive. Um, things like uh, the Smart Building Accelerator, which is sort of a demonstration program around smart buildings um, that, that is, is really important, um, was included in there as well. So I, I would cite those as a couple of examples. And, and did you say we were going to move later to, to talking about what we're, what we're hoping for? Yeah, well, I mean, you touched on a few things in your overview and, you know, the Business Council for Sustainable Energy is very excited about the building retrofit programs that you have. And I know that we're working together to see how they could advance this year. Um, but, you know, it's, I guess at, the, at a high level, we'll go into some more detail later. What are you hoping to accomplish from a policy perspective here in Washington this year? Yeah, I mean, we think there's a real opportunity this year, and, and we think that, that Congress can get some things done and, and put some things on, on, on President Biden's desk. And, and it, a lot of it is around buildings. I mean, the, the, the retrofit campaign that we talked about, we know we have built public buildings are need a lot of work. And, and, you know, energy efficiency improvements to those buildings can help pay for that. They can make, you can use energy efficiency, long-term cost savings from energy efficiency to cover improvements for things like resilience and improved air quality and, and those sorts of things. 
Um, tax incentives for energy efficiency are, are woefully outdated. They took a, a step forward with the with the commercial buildings one, but we need better tax incentives for homeowners to encourage homeowners to make a fish, put you know more insulation in the attic and and step up their windows of their HVAC. Um, and, and, and also for new home construction, um, we build a million new houses in the United States every year. And if we're not building those the right way, we are baking in you know a lot of homes and a lot of carbon emissions and a lot of wasted energy consumption for, for decades to come. Um, and then also the, the small business program that I mentioned. I mean, I think we know small businesses are hurting. That's a way that, that we can, we can Create some some incremental savings for those for those uh, small businesses that, that can that can uh, help them improve their bottom line. Thanks, Ben. Um, Allison, I don't know if you have anything that you want to share about either highlights from last year that were impactful or things you're looking out for in this new Congress. Sure, I think I'll focus more on the new Congress. Um, you know, for 2021, with all the emphasis on climate, whether it be goals our individual states have or our company's you know own goals uh you know or uh, the, whatever comes out of the biden administration i think we're all looking toward our D, &D um, you know funding for those innovations that are going to carry the day and help us achieve whatever ambitious goals we may set and get us that um you know that last mile to to our goals um and then the other thing i would say is you know on infrastructure everyone's obviously looking for an infrastructure bill um you know i think everyone recognizes i mentioned in my remarks i think others mentioned it everyone recognizes the need for transmission to bring renewables from remote areas where they generate to load centers where they're needed so obviously we're really focused on transmission and what might be possible in the new congress in that vein well that's that's really helpful thanks uh Bryn, i'll go to you next please I mean, I, I would say a plus one to a couple things that, that you just mentioned, Allison. We're, we're definitely very supportive of increasing our D&D &D budget, really in the vein of saying, I think study after study is coming out and saying, we can get to 90% decarbonization. And, you know, I'm looking at this from the power sector perspective, but that last 10 or 20, even 20% 20 is, is tough. We need to make sure that we're investing in the technologies to get us the rest of the way there. But it is also very affordable and doable to get a good bit of the way there. So it's time to get started. Um, and, and part of that is, is supporting transmission to move the low cost power. Um, a couple other things that we're watching and, and paying attention to, we're certainly as an organization interested in a vision of a of a zero carbon power sector, um, eagerly engaging and, and watching the discussions around a clean energy standard. And in particular, you know, as a customer focus group, we want to make sure that a well-designed CES is leveraging competitive procurement, allowing buyers to continue to participate and drive a CES, and I think helping address some some accounting challenges that um, can help the whole system work more smoothly. Uh, and to that, to that end, one of the things that I'd call out that was in the 2020 omnibus that is is a bit more esoteric, <laughs> um, but it was actually a really important provision, which it was directing the the Energy Administ Information Administration to help harmonize and collect data from all load serving entities in the U.S. around emissions intensity and resource mixes for delivered electricity. Because if you're a customer and you don't actually know what's in the electricity being delivered to you, it's really hard to manage and change your footprint. So getting all of that data and harmonizing it and making it available to every customer that wants it is actually one of the really fundamental pieces to starting to embark on this challenge and really empowering customers. So that was a really positive development in, in, in Omnibus at the end of last year. And I think that it's a really important place to continue to build from. So um, it's like getting the plumbing right, <laughs> but the accounting is gonna be a, an important focus for us as well. Thanks, Bryn. Charles, why don't you wrap us up here with your thoughts on uh, right. accomplishments from last year and what's needed now? Well, thanks, Lisa. And and I think I you know I spoke a little bit earlier about the major accomplishments in in 2020. It is um, huge huge package and a tremendous amount of work um, by both House and Senate staffers. And I know many of you all are listening here, so so thank you for your efforts over the past years and and decade, as Lisa mentioned. Um, when we're looking ahead, there are a couple of real key priorities uh, in my mind. One is a, a standalone energy storage tax credit um, is, is really going to be a big deal uh, for unlocking what is a, a, a nascent industry that has been growing, but really stands to gain a lot uh, over the next few years and help assure that what we're seeing in terms of solar and wind penetration can continue on that trajectory. 
um, without any, any reliability problems. Uh, we want to make sure that energy storage is available uh, at scale, um, not just from, from hydropower capabilities that we have uh, now, but, but looking at battery storage uh, as well. The other part that's maybe underlooked um, is looking at, at carbon capture utilization and storage, but the, the type of infrastructure that's gonna be needed to really move um, CO2 as it, after it's been captured um, to storage locations or to areas where it can be put into manufacturing process and be, can be utilized. We're talking about pipelines, uh, we're talking about um, you know, condensing units and what it is gonna be needed to, to move that stuff around. Um, because as Molina showed earlier, fossil fuels are in the, in the mix. Uh, they're gonna to continue to see a, a lot of investment in this area. Um, and so we need to be thinking about how to capture carbon at scale, move it at scale, sequester it at scale. Um, continue to see the, the growth in renewables, but also focusing on the carbon uh, management compo component of it too. Great, thank you. Well, I'm gonna ask one more just kind of broad question and then I'm gonna turn it over to Dan Brissett. He's gonna ask a few questions of our panel. And again, if you have questions, uh, Dan will let you know again when he starts how you can send them to us. But, you know, I, I don't wanna leave, you know, 2020 without talking a little bit about the tr tremendous resilience of all of our industries despite really significant challenges you know, Ben talked about um, some of the impacts to clean energy workers, but companies, um, communities, working in public-private partnership, um, our industry sectors all, you know, made tremendous uh, changes very quickly to try to adjust to the business conditions of COVID-19. And I, I just wanted to know if anyone wanted to share a little bit about what their industry or their company um, experienced I know, you know, just kind of big picture, some of the things we highlighted in the, the fact book, you know, we had equipment manufacturers and utilities, you know, putting staff on and sequestering them, you know, two week in increments where they would be 24 seven on site. Uh, we had fuel cell manufacturers that switched to providing ventilators and, you know, we had pop up distributed generation or propane uh, companies helping to provide power to vaccination centers, not vaccination centers at that point, testing centers. Um, and, and now they are, of course, providing it, thank goodness, to vaccination centers too. So there's just so much that was going on um, kind of behind the scenes to support communities and to, perform, to support households. So I wanted to see if anybody on the panel wanted to chime in a little bit about that, uh, you know, about what their industry experienced and if they had anything to share on you know, how they adapted. So let me see if anyone, give me, Allison, you're shaking your head. Do you have anything you want to say on that front? Thanks. Sure, yeah. I mean, when you say communities and households, I, I you know, in, in thinking about this, I thought, well, is this related to what we're talking about? But if you're going to talk about communities and households, we went through a whole wildfire season in California mm -hmm. during COVID um, and had to adapt our mitigation measures and, you know, how we handle those wildfires during during that period with COVID as an overlay, as if wildfire season isn't challenging enough. Um, so just as an example, a couple of examples, you know, we developed a virtual emergency operations center. Obviously, we have a physical one that usually during wildfire season is packed with our, our fire science team and others. Um, you know, we developed a virtual emergency operations center. So it allowed for various levels of response, whether everyone needed to be virtual or they could respond to sort of the nearest location that wasn't the EOC or situations that required folks to be physically present at the EOC. And then if they're there, we've still got to think about, they've got to be wearing masks, they've got to be socially distanced. So, I mean, things like that with the Emergency Operations Center. And then when it came to like the public, one thing that comes to mind is, you know, we still had to inform the public, we did all of these public, south, public safety power shutoffs, PSPS, as we like to call them. Um, you know, throughout various communities where we have to shut off power for safety reasons. Um, so we had a bunch of different um, drive-through wildfire safety fairs in those communities that are prone to those PSPS events. So still be able to inform the public and let them know what was going on, but in a whole different way without, you know, having folks come to a big center and, and all of that, since, you know, we're trying to distance more masks and all that. So, I mean, we had these drive-through safety fairs so folks wouldn't have to get, their, get out of their cars 
and be safe, but they could still get the same information that they'd been getting previously in prior years and prior, prior wildfire seasons. Thanks, Allison. That, that's really interesting. And, and thanks to your colleagues who both uh, quickly found alternatives and, and then put themselves out to implement them. Anybody else want to make a comment on this before we go to the next question? I guess I would only okay. say that oh. I think we, we noticed some interesting trends in the buyer community. I mean, as, as the lockdown started, we started surveying our buyer members pretty regularly. And there was, there was some initial, uh, uh, you know, I would say less than a quarter of the buyer community said, you know, we're going to kind of pause on our goals. We're going to wait and see what happens. But that means the vast majority was still full steam ahead. And we really saw that trend bear out for the most part over the remaining part of the year. You know, buyers certainly experienced the supply chain shortages and some delays in projects. Uh, absolutely. But I think, you know, where we ended the year is, is actually a really positive story to kind of how the trend line started out. Yeah, we, we surveyed our buyers too. Side. Yeah, no, but across the board from the VCSE side, we did too. We did several surveys starting in March and ending in June. And yes, uh, for certain segments of our membership, um, you know, you know, there was a lot of chaos, obviously, in the first month, month and a half. But on the utility side or the equipment manufacturer side, across our sectors, many were quickly deemed essential. And yes, they had to figure out the right um, safety protocols, but they they were not as hampered as as segments of our market that were really dealing with, um, you know, the residential side of the business. But you know, despite that, we overcame and, you know, we still have work to do, but we, you know, we were able to accomplish much more than I think people thought if you had asked us six months ago. So let me turn it to Dan Brissett. He has some questions that he'd like to ask the panel. Thanks, Lisa. Um, and I, I do have a couple, and I'd like to use the first question to turn back to the uh, issue of jobs. Um, clean energy is, uh, as a sector, a fast-moving job creator. We know that. Um, people who've read the fast book, uh, fact book for multiple years, and everybody should be reading the fact book, um, see the uh, pretty remarkable uh, job growth potential in the clean energy sector. But then, of course, um, the pandemic happened, uh, renewable energy sector, energy efficiency sector, other sectors were badly hit. And while there were 3 million uh, people employed by the clean energy sector, that number took a pretty big dip. And of the largest of those sort of subsectors is energy efficiency, of course, 2.4 million. They were especially hard hit, uh, and especially those who work in the residential sector. Um, ben, I'd like to start with you. You were the one who mentioned jobs originally when we went around the horn. I'd like to turn back to you and hear from your perspective sort of what the potential is for the clean energy sector, the energy efficiency sector in particular, to be a job creator once again um, and to help uh, do its part to get the economy back on track over the course of the rest of this year and, and in the future years. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I mean, it's a great question. And I, I think there's huge opportunity. I mean, I, I think, it, at least of, to the previous question, you know, those first few months of the shutdown, the jobs numbers, if you followed the environment, the, the reports from E2 and ACOR, I mean, the jobs were enormous, the losses. And and, and, and then it kind of steadied over the summer and in the fall, we since, since then we've kind of started to claw back. We're nowhere near where we need to be, back to that 2.4 million. But I think if you put the right, obviously there's a lot of economic uncertainty right now, um, but if you put the right policies in place, I think we could be poised for a huge rebound of, of these programs and getting these folks in, back to work. And again, these are these are construction jobs. And there, I mean, they're, they, you, there's a, one study out there that shows energy efficiency jobs are in 99.9% .9 of counties. We're not talking about, you know, jobs that are on the East Coast or the West Coast or in blue states or red states. These jobs are everywhere. Um, and they're blue collar jobs. You know, you hear, I, I've heard so much lately that talk about, you know, oh, the wind technician versus the fossil fuel worker. And that's just really a false narrative. There are, there are so many different types of jobs in the clean energy sector and energy efficiency is, is you know, sort of the, the poster child for that. I mean, it, it's a really strong diversity of jobs that are spread across the country and there's, there's great potential to expand them. I think you're muted, Dan.
I can hop in and, and ask a question if if Dan's having difficulty. Um, well, can, you know, before we leave you, Ben, I actually had a question for you. So um, we've talked about it a bit at our board level, but you know, given the changes in the way people were living and working with people not going into the office last year, and we're still not, look, we're doing this virtually. We were usually all together in a very large hearing room um, in Congress, but right now we're doing it virtually. So, you know, we did see, you know, energy consumption drop considerably, but I wonder, you know, why did it drop more? You know, what was going on in commercial buildings? What was going on in households? Why, why didn't it really drop more significantly? Yeah, and, and it points to, to just how difficult it is to make those improvements. I mean, there's so much anecdotal evidence of, you know, college campuses, office buildings, uh, you know, other institutional buildings that are sitting, you know, 90% empty yet did not see their energy uh, consumption drop very much. You, you hear that from airports. We work closely with the Dallas Fort Worth airport. Um, they were not, you know, they're, they're, they're at about 20% of their travel capacity for the year and, and yet their energy bills were roughly the same. And, and so it shows we need smarter buildings. We have to, it shows, you know, there's an investment uh, challenge here. It, it requires investment to improve the efficiency of buildings, whether it's putting in better controls and, and, and making smarter buildings, and also just making them more efficient overall in terms of traditional things like better envelopes and lighting and HVAC. And so, um, you know, it's, it's I think that it, it points to the fact that it's hard to do, uh, even if they're largely empty. Thanks for that. Hey, I we got appreciate it. So what did I miss? <laughs> I guess that means the microphone worked, because um, um, you wouldn't be laughing at my bad impersonation. Um, I'm sorry That's that I missed good, the bending answer about building energy efficiency. Bef before my microphone cut out and decided that it would hang me out to dry, I was just going to ask if there were other folks, Bryn, Charles, and Allison, if you had any other thoughts about um, uh, job growth potential um, sort of moving forward as we come out of the um, you know, as we move toward vaccinations and come out of the pandemic? Well, Dan, I think that's a good question. And maybe the the only thing that I'll highlight in terms of, of job growth potential, um, I think the pandemic underscored uh, a need for a more stringent focus on supply chains and where we are getting uh, so many of our um, solar panels, wind turbine parts, um, you know, the core elements of, of the, the clean energy future, uh, whether that be, you know, mined, uh, mined minerals or critical minerals, um, to have a firmer uh, focus on that uh, and to look more carefully at how we can create that job growth in the United States. Uh, it won't happen overnight. And I think that we were fortunate that we had, you know, backlogs of solar panel warehouses full of them uh, in, in some cases that were able to be tapped. Uh, so that we didn't slip uh, further behind. But looking ahead, I, I think that there is a, a good focus and, and I think an important part of the national dialogue that is uh, trained on, on how we can insource uh, more of these jobs through strategic investment and through uh, revisions to uh, regulations, um, not you know strictly looking uh, through the lens of, of tariffs, which is not, the, the, the I think, the approach that, that we're interested in. Great, thanks. Um, for the next question, I'd like to um, sort of switch topics a little bit um, and um, think a little bit about infrastructure. Um, so infrastructure is one of those things that means everyone to ev everything to everyone, um, which in some ways means it means nothing at all. But I think conventional wisdom is, is rapidly coalescing, at least in Washington, around this idea that we're going to have some infrastructure package at some point, whichever... Mm -hmm vehicle attaches itself to if it's a standalone thing, if it's part of a larger climate bill. But I think most people are expecting that there will be something on infrastructure. I'd like to go around the panel and maybe we'll start with, with Bryn and Allison, and, you know, um, since, since Ben and Charles responded to my jobs question. But I'd like you to think about infrastructure and help our audience understand sort of where uh, in the scheme of things, uh, we might be able to identify some opportunities for bipartisanship. Um, around making investments to the energy system and the energy sector. Um, so Allison and Bryn, I'm happy to let you go first. I know 
uh, I'm, I don't know. I'm pretty sure Ben and Charles will also have some ideas about this as well, but I'm happy to defer to you first. Well, I'm going to be a little simple, so I don't know if I should go first and Bryn is going to be positive and she can follow me up um, or if we should go the other way around. But, uh, I'll take a chance and bet that I'm going to be the cynical one in the group. Um, I shouldn't say cynical. I just, you know, I think I'm more in the camp with Congressman Yarmouth. Um, I just saw that he spoke recently about more of a September timeline for an infrastructure bill, and that seems a little bit more realistic to me. I, I worry that while I do think they'll make attempts at bipartisanship, that's not ultimately how things will transpire. Um, you know, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that will be the case. But I, I, you know, to your point, I think, you know, it means different things to different people. And, you know, the conversation about roads and highways is really different than energy infrastructure um, and what's possible there. And, you know, if we're talking about the opportunity for clean infrastructure proposals, um, you know, what that means to different people and where some of the more moderate members are willing to go on that versus where more of the progressive members are going. You know, all of that said, um, all that cynicism and, and negativity aside, you know, I do think there's some opportunity for some things. I think, you know, some of the talk about the investments in the power grid, I think most people realize that um, we need more and new investment in the power grid. Um, so I think that, that that is a possibility, depending again on what we're talking about, but just in terms of having, I think most folks agree, we need a more resi resilient power grid. Um, you know, see Texas and, and other examples. Um, and then I, I also think, uh, that there is support on both sides for things like EVs and EV infrastructure, electric vehicles and electric vehicle infrastructure. I think people are seeing the writing on the wall and you've got automakers like GM coming out and, you know, I forget exactly what their goal is, but it's in the pretty near future that they're saying goodbye to gas driven vehicles and they're going to be all electric and, you know, they've got some really ambitious goals. And so following, you know, all those automakers, I think, you know, we need the infrastructure to follow it. And, you know, I think that the federal government is going to have to get on board and support um, some of that infrastructure going forward. Yeah, and I mean, you take a much broader lens at it, which is why I think it made sense for you to go first, but I support everything you just said. I think a couple of the things that, that we look at, too, is certainly, you know, the, the developing story around grid hardening and grid modernization, you know, historically, has always been very sensitive to, to the conversation around grid modernization, wanting to ensure that these costs are, are fully justified. But as we get see extreme weather event after extreme weather event, I mean, the conversation is really unifying around we've got to build, have resilience at the center of the conversation. And, and our community certainly supports that. And that fits squarely in with the kinds of smart policies that could go in an infrastructure package. We've also already touched on transmission and how important that's going to be to unlocking a low cost accelerated decarbonization transition. And then the other thing that that we think about, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways an infrastructure package could develop and what goes in it. But I mentioned earlier that the vast, vast majority of voluntary procurement has happened in organized wholesale markets. And that's because they, they provide a platform for these transactions to actually occur. They, so they accelerate clean energy, but they also have historical data showing that they, they drive down costs for customers. And, and they, because they help integrate a variety of clean energy technologies, they're going to be really integral to this transition. So we're actually doing a lot of thinking about how expanding organized wholesale markets could be supported in an infrastructure package as well because ultimately this has to be driven by the states themselves who are not currently covered by organized competitive wholesale markets but ensuring that state collaboration and and state driven initiatives studies even you know the onboarding costs are things that are accounted for because ultimately when we talk about organized markets and and transmission together these are the kinds of underlying policies that are going to really unleash decarbonization and at least cost and those are prime discussions for an infrastructure package charles what are your thoughts on this subject yeah i think that there are a lot of um areas that we're going to find are are ripe for investment one specific um, item that I that I do want to mention, though, is is that you know we talk about uh, need to transition to clean energy. We talk about um, you know the need to tackle climate change by mid-century. To do that, we're going to need a lot to build a lot of uh, big infrastructure. Some of it offshore, some of it onshore, some of it in transmission. And 
we would benefit from a serious look at the federal level of how to expedite permits for some of these large clean en energy uh, projects. Um, we've seen good examples and models. Uh, Fast 41 focused on uh, fixing America's surface transportation, um, provided a good model that you can safeguard the environment, you can safeguard local communities, and do uh, expedient permitting at the federal level and conduct these environmental reviews for big infrastructure projects that uh, cross state boundaries. And, and we're likely to see uh, the need for more of that. So um, a, a focus uh, from the legislative branch on how to, to do more of that uh, will be beneficial. Um, one of the good things the Trump administration did was uh, focus on federal one decision so that uh, large uh, project uh, proponents only deal with um, a single entity uh, in the federal government instead of utilizing or, or looking to multiple um, agencies for their environmental reviews. Uh, so a single coordinated process. Uh, the problem with executive orders is that it's in, in one administration and, and not in the other. Uh, and it's one where we would benefit from a, a durable uh, solution proposed by Congress. Uh, ben, I think you're um, next up. Sure. Um, so definitely agree about um, grid modernization, lot, lots of efficiencies to be gained there. Um, and, and would cite a few other areas that I think infrastructure where we can, we can reduce long-term operating costs for local governments and states uh, by improving efficiency. So water and wastewater uh, treatment facilities, huge amounts of energy uh, used to treat and pump and process water and deliver water. Um, uh, you know, we can, by making improvements to those facilities, we can save massive amounts of money uh, and energy and carbon emissions um, uh, through that. Um, street lights this is just a simple example. Um, there, we have about 40 million street lights uh, around the country and only about half of them are LED right now. Um, you know, that's that's a shame. Uh, they all should be. Uh, street lighting is often uh, the, the single largest energy cost of a municipality, and, and, and we need to do more um, to, to, to transition those. Um, and then also just finally, I think looking beyond what we traditionally, you know, roads, bridges types of things, and looking at buildings. And, and I mentioned um, our proposal earlier for, for critical public facilities, retrofitting those public facilities. And, you know, I think we need to think of our ports and our airports and our, and our uh, convention centers and things like that as, as our infrastructure. And, and we need to improve those. Um, and, you know, at, at there's, you know, I mentioned there, this, this proposal is based on performance contracting where there's actually not a lot of federal money that needs to go into it. We, we, can, we can have private investment. We can leverage the, the federal seed money for some private investment that is ultimately paid back through uh, the, the energy cost savings over time. Um, so there's, a, there's some really innovative ways. As, and Dan, as you know, you know the, that those types of things really have, have, can have strong bipartisan support. So we think there's a lot of opportunity out there. Great. I mean, Thanks so much for that. You have, you have that first cost barrier that we have to overcome. And, and, and finding creative ways to get past that is, is what we have to do. And that's where policy comes into play. Yeah, totally agree. Um, Lisa, I think I'm going to send it back over to you for the next couple of questions. Oh, great. Um, well, you know, just before we leave that topic, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, the Business Council for Sustainable Energy released just yesterday a letter to Cong Congress with our recommendations for an infrastructure and economic recovery package. And tying it back, Dan, to something you said before, I mean, there's been so much mention on both sides of the aisle of infrastructure as a job creator, especially as we come out of the COVID-19 pandemic. So yeah, there's a lot of promise in those words. Uh, we need to make them reality, but we have seen in the last Congress, especially with the surface transportation bill, that there is strong bipartisan support for a number of the initiatives that our panelists just mentioned. So we're rolling up our sleeves and wanna work uh, with Congress and the administration to get as much done as we can and to really use um, leverage opportunities, public-private partnerships, um, was just mentioned performance contracting. There's so many models that we can tap into where we can really uh, maximize and optimize uh, what the federal government can do. So, and then the other comment I just wanted to make, you know, we're seeing the clean energy transition throughout the country. And uh, we obviously in our membership have investor owned utilities, we have public power, we have many um, energy service companies or other developers that work in partnership with 
municipal municipalities, local communities, states, and you know they all need to find ways to continue to uh, respond to customers and have affordable, reliable, and clean energy. So it can be done. And when I think about you know some of our board members, especially those that are public utilities like an Austin Energy or a Sacramento Municipal Utility District or a SMUD, I mean they're really on the front lines of innovation and providing clean energy to their customers. So we look at it very broadly uh, in terms of you know, how the market can move forward for clean energy. So that kind of wraps up the maybe a domestic uh, conversation. I wanted to talk a little bit about the US involvement internationally in sustainability and climate change. As you probably all know, uh, just last month, the US officially re-entered the Paris Agreement. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what that means for your industry sector, what it means for your company or your association. So I don't know who wants to dive in first, but tell me a little bit um, about the Paris Agreement and is that a, a market mover from where you sit? I can start, but I'll be very brief. <laughs> um, okay, I, I think. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, I think it's going to be really interesting. We certainly have supported rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement. It'll be really interesting to see what the administration develops in terms of NDCs and, and are very eager to participate in that process. But overall, I mean, we, we think that any, any, you know, to meet those goals, you're not going to meet those kind of carbon emissions goals without really, really significant gains in energy efficiency. The IEA estimates that, that energy efficiency will be 40 to 45 percent of the carbon emissions reductions needed to meet the goals of the Paris Climate Accord. Um, so, you know, almost half. And, and so, you know, whatever you come up with, you're going to have to have a lot of efficiency thrown in there. Well, you mentioned something in NDC nationally determined contribution can you know i'm happy to explain it or do you want to explain what an ndc is please do lisa okay well i mean basically it's the it's the goal that the united states would bring forward to the framework convention and climate change and the paris agreement saying what our um, ambition level will be sometimes over the next decade or taking us out to 2050 and so by re-engaging in the paris agreement our, our federal government has an opportunity to articulate that again. The Obama administration did uh, once the Paris Agreement was uh, adopted, and now we have a, a new opportunity for the Biden-Harris administration to communicate that. And we are expecting that we will hear uh, a bit about what that long-term goal will be in the coming weeks. But let me ask others, um, does involvement in international climate change processes mean anything from your company or your sector? How does it impact you? I mean, I'll just jump in briefly. I mean, REBA as an organization is, is pretty domestically focused, but you know, our members, whether it's Walmart or Amazon or Microsoft or Google or Johnson & Johnson or whoever it is, they have global footprints and they have set these incredibly ambitious emission reduction targets for their own operations. And that means globally. Oftentimes, if, if we're talking about where the bulk of their emissions are, it's in their supply chain. Oftentimes, the bulk of their supply chain is globally. So, you know, there's lots of inherent interest for them to also be thinking about, we've got to be tackling this challenge at a global level. And there have been so many high-level business statements supporting rejoining Paris. So, I mean, I think that the takeaway is that the business community on the whole is very supportive of rejoining Paris and ensuring that this is that there's a global coordinated effort because ultimately companies are not going to be successful in reaching their own emission reductions unless there's also an overlay to that framework that's driving the ambition across the board. Thank you. Well, let me ask um, one other question kind of building on corporate action and corporate commitments. You know, we, we talked a lot about the activity in renewable energy procurement or in energy efficiency and energy productivity commitments, sustainable transportation. That was a great slide that you showed, Bryn. But, you know, what I certainly am hearing more of my members talk about, um, which we talked about a little bit here, is hydrogen and the hydrogen supply chain and renewable thermal opportunities like biogas or renewable natural gas. Um, Allison, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, you know, about how uh, Sempra and its companies are thinking about hydrogen and RNG. 
Yeah, I mean, when you were talking about Paris, that's sort of what I was thinking in my head is, is you know, in terms of, you know, what kind of market signals is it sending? You know, one, I think, I think um, companies are already moving in that direction and trending in that direction that, you know, they're coming out with all kinds of, um, you know, net zero by 2050 goals. And part of that is Paris. Part of that is, you know, we never stopped. The industry never stopped, you know, following, you know, whatever administration was in. It's not like we all suddenly threw up our hands during the Trump administration and said, oh, we don't have to care about that anymore. Um, you know, just given the states that some of us operate in, you know, we're based in California. Um, you know, California has its own really ambitious goals. So, um, you know, we wanted to be very thoughtful about ensuring we were making commitments that we could keep. Um, so, you know, we'll have more about that in the coming weeks. But in terms of hydrogen, I kind of spoke of that already. Both SoCal Gas and, and SDG &E have all kinds of demonstration projects that they're working on. We've got all kinds of partnerships with UC Irvine is one of the on the forefront of um, hydrogen and renewable natural gas technology. Um, and then in terms of commitments, actually, as far as renewable natural gas goes, SoCal Gas, SoCal gas has already committed to deliver 5% renewable natural gas to core customers by 2022 and 20% by 2030. And I think we're already at something like two or 3% RNG right now. So, you know, we've got some pretty ambitious goals when it comes to renewable natural gas. Um, you know, there's, there's a way to go in both um, hydrogen and renewable natural gas. Part of that is cost. Um, but, you know, we're on our way and hopefully some of the research and development that we talked about that may come from the federal government and Congress, maybe that'll help us um, get to the next level on both of those technologies. Thank you. So I've got one final question before I turn it to Dan, who's going to... Um, close us out maybe with asking everybody on the panel to just give a final thought. But before we do that, Charles, I, I wanted to talk to you. I know one of your favorite slides that you didn't show today is a slide about um, the levelized cost of energy, levelized cost of electricity across a number of different technologies. And this is an area where Bloomberg New Energy Finance has a lot of expertise. And, you know, certainly we've seen over time uh, dramatic changes in, and cost reductions in many technologies and kind of different technologies becoming more cost competitive. And I was just wondering, you know, from your perspective, you know, what are you, were you surprised by the rapid change? You know, what's the impact? Does that change the conversation and offer more opportunity for bipartisanship? Just wondering what your impression is since you love to talk and share that slide. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Lisa. And, and we don't have the slide here, uh, but, but no. basically what it shows is that almost always it is going to be cheaper for new generation to be brought online that is solar, wind, uh, or, or natural gas, um, and increasingly solar and wind. And it's that's happening um, because of market pressures and because there is a, a crowding in of investment in this space. Um, folks are competing against one another, and and the prices are are coming down at a at a tremendous rate. It doesn't surprise me. I'm a firm believer in in free markets, and and while there's a, a tremendous amount of incentive that's been put forward by the federal government for tax incentives to help get us to this point, we're at this point where we've really um, crossed a threshold. We're going to continue to see these prices um, come down, and and that's really encouraging if you're looking at accomplishing Paris goals. Paris alone. Uh, the, the the agreement is is not enough. What we need to see is the deployment of a lot of different technology, not just in the United States, um, but around the world. And I think that you do see bipartisan consensus that um, the U.S. has a, a role to play in that future. And I think that's why um, we kept touching on the, the Energy Act of 2020 in this conversation. Um, that was a bipartisan agreement that was years uh, in the making. More needs to be done, but I think it's proof that it's uh, this is an area that's ripe uh, for, for conversation and compromise between Democrats and Republicans. Um, and it's one where uh, discrete federal roles that complement state policies can really um, empower the marketplace to act. And, and Lisa, to your point earlier, clean energy is what consumers want, what big companies want, what little companies want. And if we uh, are able to match supply with that unprecedented demand will be in a, in, in a very good place. Thank you. Dan, back to you. All right, so now we're gonna conclude with a lightning round. Uh, and what we'll do is just 
everyone and Melina and Lisa, I think this goes for you too. Um, love to hear a closing comment, a final takeaway, something that is in the, the fact book is a tremendous resource. We've covered part of it. Um, you could, we could, we could have done a 10 hour panel uh, and, and spent time on every slide. It really is so extensive. But if there was something else in the fact book, takeaways, uh, anything else that you want to do, this would be a great time to do it. And like I said, Melina and Lisa, I'm happy to start with you. And then we'll maybe we'll go through the panel in the order that they originally presented. Well, yeah, I'll I go can first. Go first. Oh. oh, you can no. go, Lisa. <laughs> no, I'm just going to give you a little time to think about oh. what you wanted to say. So. Um, I'll just, you know, end with what I said in the beginning, like the two driving forces that really impressed me. It's the cost reduction of so many technologies and resources um, that are driving the changes we're seeing and that customers seek out this. The demand for clean, affordable, reliable energy is strong and growing. And we're very fortunate that we have a diverse portfolio of technologies in the United States to provide it. Now we also have some longer term goals um, it, as it comes to sustainability and climate. So we're on the path to get there, but the foundation is strong and commercially available technologies we have now can do even more to get us along that pathway. So that's my concluding thought. Thanks. Melina? Yeah, I mean, when I think about the future of energy, I mean, I think about the short term and then I think about the mid and long term. In the short term, I mean, what needs to happen is market reform first and foremost. Um, and as was pointed out before, transmission build out. But then in the medium to long term, I think, you know, if we're serious about decarbonizing, like, yes, we have like some goals around hydrogen and funding for hydrogen, but we really need to come up with a way to expand the infrastructure system to support hydrogen storage and transportation. And I think like if, if, as I said, if we are serious about hydrogen, that's an area where we are compared to other nations, like pretty closely unprepared. Um, so I think, yeah, when I think about the energy future and when I think about where future policy could be focused, that's kind of the area I would be thinking about. Yeah. Sure. Thanks for that. Um, Charles, takeaways, last thoughts, final comments? Yeah, a couple of, of uh, additional comments, I think, is that um, when we look at the fact book, we see rapid growth in some areas and we see stagnation uh, or even decline in, in other areas. Um, I men mentioned the energy storage tax credit. I think that's important uh, for keeping renewables on the growth trajectory, for keeping energy storage on the trajectory. Um, if it's the bacon on the grid, it's going to make everything better. Uh, we need more of it, and it's going to help uh, solve a lot of the problems that we, we do see on the grid uh, today. The other component and thing I want to mention is that we're not seeing a triumphant growth in hydropower. Apparently, not all renewables are created equally, and we're seeing um, you know, a little bit of growth in, in hydropower, but considering there are 88,000 dams in this country and only 3% of them produce power, there's a huge untapped potential there and, and an area where we could look uh, and harness electric power um, in places that are probably closer to our backyards than a lot of folks uh, realize and, and imagine. Uh, so there is a huge generating capacity there and, and opportunity, uh, but it's a matter of, of uh, looking in some unlikely locations. Okay. Ben? Yeah, I think I would, uh, so we haven't talked a lot about equity and environmental justice here, but obviously that's a huge component of this. I think we all know, you know, the damage, uh, just pollution, conventional pollutions, the damage of climate change and the, and the outsized impact that that has on, uh, has had and, and will have on, on disadvantaged communities um, and communities of color. Um, I think, so, you know, but all of what we're talking about here is, is a way to, to address that. And then additionally, when you look at economic opportunity um, and, and if we structure it the right way, we make sure that federal investment, that this policy is directed in a way that investment goes into communities that have not had opportunities. Um, we can and provide workforce training, things like Bobby Rush's uh, Blue Collar to Green Collar Jobs Act. If we do it the right way, we can create not just jobs, but also entrepreneurial opportunities for, for lower income communities. Um, and then finally, and I, I think this is really a, where if energy efficiency uniquely can, can benefit is in 
um, is in cost savings and in, in reducing energy bills. Um, you know, the energy burden on uh, the poor and the working poor is enormous. But you know, a, you know higher income households spend three or four percent of their income on energy bills, and, and many lower income households fifteen to twenty percent of their paycheck on paying their energy bills. And we've got to do something about that because that that is a huge. Uh, cost to those families and, and energy efficiency can really help there. Thanks. Bryn? Uh, well, thank you for, for bringing that in because I think that that's just such an important message and, and this transition is going to hinge on, on whether we do that well. Um, I mean, coming from the power, per, power sector perspective, it, I mean, this just feels like such an exceptionally important time for legislative action amidst a really exceptional rate of change in the power sector. We have we have a power grid that was built for the, the 20th century with 20th century technologies, but significant disruptions and challenges are really requiring us to re-examine how, how we build a clean, affordable, and reliable grid starting now. Extreme weather is disrupting power grids, customer needs and demands are changing. And so so really how we plan, build, and operate our grid needs to adapt to these changing circumstances of, of the 21st century. And, and a huge segment of the business community wants to see a bipartisan, durable, markets enhancing set of policies that sets us on that decarbonization trajectory. And there, there hasn't been a more important time for non-incremental action. Allison? Yeah, you know, we talked a bunch during this conversation about infrastructure, and I think, you know, the fact book demonstrates year over year how the industry has evolved, you know, over the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years, we're going to need to evolve even further and more dramatically to meet some of the, you know, climate goals that we have set and are going to set, you know, and just in terms of infrastructure, I mean, we envision a future where, you know, we use our, our um, current infrastructure to move around lower to you know zero carbon molecules and work in tandem to decarbonize our country's markets and homes and transportation while you know still to the economic justice you know point of providing resilient sustainable affordable um you know energy to folks great well thank you uh for that um, we are just about at time, and so we will begin our wrap-up process. Um, Lisa, great to work with you on today's briefing. Thanks to you and the rest of the BCS team. Thanks to our panelists, Melina, Charles, Ben, Bryn, Allison. Thank you so much for being with us today. Also like to give a special shout out once again to our friends with the Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. Senators Reed, Crapo, Van Hollen, and Collins, uh, thank you very much for all of your support bringing this briefing to our audience today. Um, I'd like to thank Troy, who uh, is sitting behind the scenes. Those of us on the panel can see him. Those of you watching the live feed cannot. Um, he is the wizard behind the curtain who helps bring our, our briefings to folks when, when we use this format. So thank you very much for all your hard work today, Troy. Thanks to Dan O'Brien, Sidney O'Shaughnessy, Amber Todorov, Anna McGinn, Omri Laporte, I name everybody because at ESI, it really does take a village to put one of these briefings on. And so thanks to everybody who puts all the effort in. And we have five tremendous interns and they all do a lot putting these, uh, helping us pull these briefings off as well. So thanks to Celine, Hamza, Jocelyn, Kimmy, and Rachel for that. Um, we will put up a slide in just a moment with a link to a survey. Um, we uh, read all of your feedback if you in our audience if you have two minutes to take the survey, we would really, really appreciate the feedback. Um, if there are technical issues that you encountered or if you have suggestions for future topics, we really do read everything that you submit. So please take a moment to do that. A um, few other quick EEI-centric reminders. Um, please um, come back. Uh, we have a just a tremendous slate of briefings coming up over the next couple months. I think the next one on the calendar is March 26th, which I think is a Friday. That's the third installment of our Congressional Climate Camp series. And it's going to be a really excellent look um, at um, sort of current attitudes and, and past policy attempts to um, enact climate change uh, or climate policy in Washington. It's going to be a really excellent look. I hope everyone will be able to tune in for that. And uh, if you missed anything, uh, please go back and watch the archive. Everything, including presentation materials, is available online at www.esi.org. 
While you're there, I hope you will sign up for our newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. And right after that, I hope you go visit the fact book because uh, it is a tremendous resource. Um, again, we've really just skimmed the surface today. Um, if you're interested in a comprehensive overview of what the clean energy sector in the United States looks like right now, uh, it is really the only resource and um, one that certainly I find myself going back to time and time again uh, to understand uh, sort of where things are and, and what the trends that have led us uh, or and, and the trends that have happened in the past that have led us to where we are today. So with that, we will close down. Thanks again to our panelists. Thanks to BCSE. Thanks to the Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. I hope everyone has a great rest of your Friday and happy weekend.